Leo Carrier. Hey, we can do much better than that, folks. Come on. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andy Borowitz, and I want to welcome you to the New Yorker Festival. Come on. Tonight's show is called Tales Out of School 4, Stories About the New Yorker, presented by The Moth. Let's hear it for The Moth, ladies and gentlemen. We can... Yes. Before we begin, I have to ask everybody if you've got any kind of uh, phone, smartphone, uh, anything, please turn it all the way off, not just to, to vibrate, but all the way down. Um, appreciate it, because it interferes with the recording equipment. Okay, thank you very much. Before we continue, um, this is, I guess, one of the very first events. Yeah, no, don't turn the volume up on your phone. Actually, that was almost the opposite of what I said. Okay. There's a learning, oh, Siri, blame it on Siri, of course. <laughs> Siri didn't know what I was saying. Yeah, that's, big, that's a big surprise. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before we get going, and we're off to a fantastic start. By the way, that was somebody from The Moth who did that. So let's let you know how well we're working together in concert so far. Um, before we begin, there are a couple very special people, special to The New Yorker and special to The New Yorker Festival that I have to acknowledge. First of all, the woman who makes this festival happen year in, year out, and as a result, has developed uh, a heroin addiction. Um, let's hear for Rhonda Sherman. Rhonda. And also a man without whom we wouldn't have The New Yorker every week, the editor of The New Yorker, David Remnick, is here. So let's hear for David. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, I have to say David's the reason I'm at The New Yorker because I'd been writing this online column for a long time called The Borowitz Report, and David came to me and asked me if I would start doing it for The New Yorker. And I was like, man, I would be so honored. I would, I would like, do that for free. And it turns out he had the exact same idea. <laughs> um, so it's so awesome when you're on the same page like that because then the deal can really like coalesce very quickly. Um, so so that's, that's been amazing. Um, now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, are, are familiar with The Moth and what we do at The Moth? We have a few, most of you. You listen to the radio show or the podcast. I mean, to give you an idea, The Moth is basically, um, it's very, very simple and very old fashioned. It's storytelling. People get up here um, without any notes or any cheat sheets or note cards or anything. And they just uh, tell a story from beginning, middle to end. It's, that's all it is. Um, and now, you know, stories can take a lot of different forms. I mean, you can have totally true stories, like, you know, the stories that, that David Sedaris tells. Or you could have, like, <laughs> oh, it's not true. They are. And then, you know, then you have, like, you know, on the other, you have, like, totally, you know, like, fables and make-believe and things like that, like the stories that, like, Paul Ryan tells. <laughs> and... Um, but we, we at the, at the New Yorker, uh, at, the, the, at the New Yorker Festival and the, and the Moth, you know, we're, we're, New Yorker is always about fact checking and, and, and really into facts. And, and the Moth is all about true stories. So all the stories you're going to hear tonight are 100% true. And that's what makes this kind of an, an exciting thing. Now, everybody on stage tonight writes for the New Yorker. And when you, when you think about the New Yorker, the New Yorker has this image of being kind of quintessential New York. Are, are a lot of people here from different places around the country and you've come here especially for this New York experience? <clears throat> well, this is interesting. What you're gonna find tonight is that a lot of the people, most of the people involved in the New Yorker um, aren't even from New York. I mean, we draw from all over the world. Like, there are people on stage tonight from different countries, like, like England and Texas. and <laughs> And the New Yorker has always been, you know, this sort of nexus of people coming together from different places. I'm from a place called um, Shaker Heights, Ohio. I don't know if any of you, are, we have some, represent, yes. Um, Shaker Heights, it's a suburb of Cleveland. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's sort of a strange um, place in some ways because it was founded by this religious order called the Shakers. And I don't know what you know about the Shakers, but they're known really for two main things. One is um, they're known for their furniture. They make this very beautiful 
simple, these simple shaker chairs that are, that are very lovely and simple. And then the other thing that they're kind of famous for is a key ten tenet of their religion, uh, which was that they never had sex, seriously. And um, growing up in Shaker Heights, my experience really mirrored theirs in several ways, um, um, except that I didn't make chairs. But I, was, I grew up being you know, very kind of confused, I guess, about, about sex and all that. I, I, you know, I, I, I was interested, I was always interested in this stuff. And I remember at an early age, I was probably about five or six, I asked my mom um, uh, where babies came from. And she was a very progressive lady. She'd grown up on the Upper West Side in New York and was into really being, you know, frank with your children. And so she said, um, when a man and woman fall in love, they get married and they go to bed together and uh, the man puts his penis in the woman's vagina and then um, nine months later, there's a baby. And I was like, fair enough. <laughs> you know? Would, wouldn't have been my first guess, but <laughs> I see no reason not to believe this. It sounds credible. But I guess, you know, I, I didn't ask like a key follow-up question because I came away from this thinking that all of this transpired while the couple was asleep. And it wasn't until years later that I realized one of you has to be awake. And, you know, we, when I got into high school, Shakerites High, you know, they had sex education, but that really didn't make things any better because the whole approach to teaching sex there was, was kind of strange. And this is, I remember this so clearly because this is exactly how it happened. The first day of class, they gave us something called um, a sexual inventory test. And what this was was they gave each of us a sheet of sexual terms, and we had to write down on the sheet um, to the best of our ability, um, what our guess was, what each of these terms meant. And then, without signing our names to the papers to avoid embarrassment, you know, we handed them back into the teacher, and then she read all of our answers aloud. You know, it's sort of the blind leading the blind, really, but that was their idea. And I still remember two of these answers very clearly. Um, one of them, um, one kid defined wet dream as when the sperms come out at night. <laughs> Terrifying. It's like, sounds like a George Romero film, you know, or something, you know. And then I remember one answer, um, one kid defined menopause as the break a prostitute takes between customers. <laughs> That kid was me, actually, I have to... <laughs> okay, so that is an example of a totally true story. I, everything in that story actually happened. Um, it's a little bit shorter than the stories you're gonna hear tonight. The stories you're gonna hear tonight are going to be 10 minutes long or thereabouts. And um, after um, that 10 minute uh, time has elapsed, um, this is where Leo Carey um, comes in here. Let's have a nice other round of applause for Leo because Leo's done a great job. Leo um, is, uh, by the way, just so you know what his affiliation is, he is the um, deputy books editor. Is that, is that your title, deputy? You're not? What is your title now? You're senior editor? Senior editor. Excuse me. <laughs> um, he is now um, editor of the New Yorker is his new title. <laughs> we, there's a lot of mobility in the ranks here. Um, he is well. He's senior editor. He would last just last year. You were deputy books editor. What happened? Did you did you really kill on one of those briefly noted? And they said <laughs> move him right up to the corner office. They finally worked out for how much I was doing already. Oh, it was what you were already. So in other words, you were already doing that already. So in other words, you had been kind of underappreciated up to that point. You would say, no, 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 not at all. Well, he is he is now senior editor. Excuse me, and I am now fired. I guess, um, but. Um, but what Leo really does at the New Yorker is we have a fantastic, on the top floor, a fantastic lounge. And Leo plays the piano there all day. And it's an amazing <laughs> thing. He'll do, you know, you just come in like I said the other day, I want to hear The Man I Love. And uh, Leo just ripped it out. It was great. Wonderful on karaoke nights, too. Leo is unbelievable. 
Um, but Leo plays a very important role tonight, which is that he is our timekeeper. As I said, the stories are 10 minutes long, thereabouts. And when we get to 10 minutes, Leo is going to give everybody a little bit of a warning. What do you do at that point, Leo? That's nice. Let's hear it for that. That was amazing. Was that like a suspended chord? What, was, what is that? It's a much argued about chord. A much argued about chord. <laughs> this is the kind of discussions we have at the New Yorker all day. <laughs> we argue about chords. I believe that wasn't a suspended chord. Um, okay, so that was what you do after 10 minutes. Then they have a little time to wrap up, and then what do you do? Whoa! You do not want that happening to you. Not on this stage. Let's hear it again for Leo Carey. Are we ready to go? Okay. Well, everybody in, in tonight's show is very distinguished, and you can read their, their bios in the program. But to get uh, introduce you to them a little bit in a more personal way, I asked each one of them a question, the same question that they could uh, answer before they come up on stage. And uh, the question I asked them is, tell us something about the New Yorker we don't know. A little bit of New Yorker trivia, which is an interesting thing. Um, so let me get the ball rolling. I'll tell you something. I just found this out the other day, and it actually involves David Remnick, which is that um, David has been editor of the New Yorker now for 14 years, and he has, in that time, never read the New Yorker, <laughs> interestingly. It's been stacking up on his nightstand, <laughs> keeps meaning to get to it. He's heard there's some great stories there, but interesting. Editors of The New Yorker, they're just like us. It's an amazing thing. So now, um, let's start with our first storyteller of the night. Um, uh, she, she's a great woman, great writer. And um, I asked her to tell us something about The New Yorker uh, we, we didn't know. And actually, this is something I didn't know, and it's a typical kind of New Yorker fact. You know, like sometimes in a word like um, re-election um, in The New Yorker, there's the, there are those helpful two dots over the second E um, to, to let us know how to pronounce the word re-election. It's very helpful. Well, those two dots are often mistakenly called an umlaut, um, but they are not an umlaut, not in the English language. They're actually a diaresis. That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Want to tend on a high note like that. Let's hear it for Lauren Collins. Lauren. I needed to talk to somebody. I had committed what I thought uh, might have been a firing offense, and I had to get someone on the phone. So I got out my phone and I started scrolling through, and I called some friends, and nobody answered. And I called some colleagues, and I got voicemail after voicemail. And I called my mother, and she was out playing tennis. So I dialed the law offices of Hewlett, Collins, and Allard a small law firm in Wilmington, North Carolina, my father's, and was put through to him. And I said, Dad, something really, really bad happened. And he said, Honey, what is it? And I said, Something happened with Donatella Versace. And we talked for a few minutes, and my father paused, and he gave me great comfort. He said, Lauren, I'll tell your mother. It's happened before. It will happen again, and we will get through it. I said, thank you so much, Dad. And he said, wait, honey, one more thing. Who's Donatella Versace? Is she one of your friends? <laughs> Donatella Versace is not one of my friends. Um, she is an Italian fashion designer, a sort of cross between Barbarella and Pamela Anderson, once described by her own brother as nuclear. Um, in addition, Donatella is sort of the Lyndon Johnson of fashion. Um, she ascended to the head of the Versace empire after her brother was murdered, and, and she wasn't really ready to take over. And for that reason, she's a woman who likes things how, how she likes them. She's surrounded by uh, legions of minders and minions, and, and things have to be just so. 
Um, Donatella smokes. She smokes a lot of cigarettes. And you know how the packs of cigarettes normally say something like smoking kills or don't do this if you're pregnant? Or um, Donatella's cigarettes don't say that because members of her staff painstakingly peel off that label on every one of her packs of cigarettes and instead put something that says DV's Special Marlboro Reds. That's what she likes to see on her packs of cigarettes. Donatella, when, uh, when she travels, she has the same candles everywhere, and um, she often brings her own sheets. If she doesn't like the furniture in a place, she'll just ship in a bed and a sofa. And Anyway, she's particular about things. Um, in fact, in the year before I had been assigned to do this piece, her publicist had become irate at the suggestion in one of our competing publications that Donatella's ex-husband, still a friend of hers, had sweaty armpits. I think they had demanded a correction. <laughs> um, anyhow, we had negotiated for a long time to get this story going, and Donatella's people had choreographed it very tightly, sort of using dental tools to figure out every little step of our agenda. And I wasn't sure that the profile was going so well. I wasn't sure I was glimpsing the real Donatella. So finally we negotiated that I would have some time alone with her. And I was uh, to go to Lake Como with her, where the family villa, um, a beautiful villa called Villa Fontanelle on the shores of Lake Como is. So uh, Donatella met me one morning. She picked me up in a sort of blacked out sedan it was a Mercedes. There was a driver in the front wearing an earpiece, Massimo, the driver. And we're in the back seat, and Donatella and I are facing each other. We kind of have our legs curled up, um, you know, under us. And it's girl talk. It's going really well. She's telling me um, some sort of personal things. You know, no one wants to date her, she said, because... They feel that I'm a nightmare. And then she also said something which I've never figured out what it meant. <laughs> and if anyone can tell me, it was, I hate my foot. I remember that. <laughs> that. That was what happened at the beginning of our ride. So anyway, it's the middle of the summer. Very, very hot. We're in Italy. It's stifling. And Massimo uh, has the windows up. And Donatella is chain-smoking her special... Uh, DV special Marlboro red cigarettes in the back, wearing lots of perfume. It was kind of um, a cross between gardenias and a Yankee candle um, factory. <laughs> and anyway, um, Massimo is, we're, we're going on these hairpin turns, and I'm kind of bracing myself as we're making these lurching turns. And Donatella at one point, I think, realizes that. Um, the driving is getting a little hairy, and she pipes up and says, Oh, I will die, Massimo. And then she looks at me and goes, Ha ha, he is a great driver. <laughs> and we go on. <laughs> but I wasn't feeling so good. Um, my mouth started watering, and I started having sort of palpitations, and kind of like I am now. Um, <laughs> but my heart was beating fast. And I thought, this isn't going to happen. Um, not because the physical symptoms weren't suggesting that it would, but because I thought, no, this is too horrible. It's too embarrassing. It just it doesn't ever happen to people just trying to do their jobs. And so Donatella and I continued to talk. And she's really opening up. And I feel like I'm starting to get a sense of who she is. But the second I realized that it was actually going to happen, we shot into a tunnel carved into an Italian mountainside. And then I threw up on Donatella Versace. <laughs> Donatella was pressing the buttons of the car as though, as though she thought it had an ejector seat. She wanted out. <laughs> But she was very, very kind, and she turned from this Barbarella-like figure into this comforting Italian mama, and kind of like a school nurse started patting my arm and, and saying, it is my fault, you will be fine. And who knew that in the bottom of her pocketbook sort of splattered with, <laughs> with my throw-up, she kept a tiny packet of travel Kleenex, which came in very handy for the occasion. Anyhow, we proceeded to Lake Como, and we pulled up in the driveway. And 
her manservant named this kind of lunk, a blonde ponytailed lunk of a man named Bruce emerged from the villa and handed me a very heavy crystal tumbler and said, here, drink this, is lemon without sugar. And I drank it and I thought, maybe this is just going to be our secret. Maybe I'm going to get away with this. So we spent the day and we toured the villa. We had a lovely lunch lakeside with caviar and wine and tiramisu. And Elton John called during lunch and Donatella, Donatella picked up and she didn't mention me. And I thought, I'm fine. So at last the day came to an end and I left. And I got back to New York, and, and despite my father's ministrations, I was still feeling so uneasy. And I thought, I've got to tell my boss what happened. He's going to get a call from the 100 Versace publicist saying, who is this rank amateur you sent to Milan who threw up on Donatella Versace? <laughs> so I, I sheepishly shuffled into David's office one day. And I said, David, I've got to confess. I've got to tell you something. And he said, Lauren, what is it? And I said, I threw up on Donatella Versace. It was the least of David's problems. I think he had John Lee Anderson off in a firefight somewhere. Reporters all over the world in far more dangerous uh, hot spots than Lake Como. And he said, listen, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But there's one thing you have to do. Your penance is that you're going to have to put it in the story. Which I did discreetly, far more discreetly than the way I'm telling the story tonight. But um, I put it in the story and I soon learned that there is a secret fraternity of journalists all over the world who have thrown up on their subjects. <laughs> I heard from all of them, it's a fantastic icebreaker. I recommend it. <laughs> Sometimes I've wished I could sort of orchestrate uh, the old throw up on your subject trick, um, but I haven't done it again yet. But yes, there's a whole group of us and we keep abreast of the, of the news. Um, did you know that Justin Bieber recently vomited twice at a performance in Arizona? We're, we're in very good company. Um, anyhow, I put it in the story and that was pretty much that. Um, but at Lake Como that day, there was one more thing. I went back to the driveway and I saw the car, the black Mercedes where I had left my mark. And <laughs> I started to open the door and I felt a heavy hand on my shoulder. And it was Bruce, the manservant, who had fed me the nectar that would, that would heal me. And Bruce said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Something has come up, and Donatella will be riding back separately. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Lauren Collins. Yeah. Something has come up. I love that turn of phrase. Um, okay. Right, moving on to our next storyteller, uh, I asked him uh, to tell us something about The New Yorker that we don't know. And you know, The New Yorker over the years has had amazing uh, cartoonists, you know, from like Charles Adams, Roz Chast, Bibi Netanyahu, We've just had amazing <laughs> contributors. But one thing that, in typical New Yorker fashion, even the cartoons are fact-checked. This is true. So, didn't know that, did you? Didn't care either, apparently. <laughs> Nicholas Schmidl. So last October, I got an assignment to write about the trial of Victor Boot. Victor Boot is a Russian arms trafficker who had, was arguably one of the most prolific arms traffickers in the world and had earned the nickname the Merchant of Death as a result of his alleged dealings with all sorts of nasty regimes and organizations, including the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Charles Taylor of Liberia. And Victor had been arrested in March of 2008 in Thailand in a DEA sting in which Victor was planning to sell weapons to people who he believed to be members of the Colombian group, the FARC, but were in fact undercover DEA agents. 
and Victor was extradited back to the United States, to the United States in November of 2010, and charged with four crimes, conspiring to transport surface-to-air missiles, conspiring to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization, conspiring to kill Americans, and conspiring to kill U.S. federal officers. Heavy charges. And I sat through the trial for three weeks, and at the end, Victor was convicted. He was ultimately sentenced to 25 years. And at the end, I had some fabulous material. The government had put forth hours of intercepted phone calls, surveillance tape, email exchanges. But it was only my third story for the magazine, and I had been concerned all along that I wasn't going to be able to get deep enough, that the story hadn't had enough time to germinate. My second piece for the magazine was about a murder that had taken place 26 years earlier. And here I'm trying to cover this real time. And so I knew that to be able to give it that New Yorker touch, I was going to have to really give readers a sense and, and get a sense for myself of who was Victor Boot. And so I charted out three options. The first of which was to go to Russia and to spend some time with Victor's family and friends, some defense analysts, some former spooks. And David Remnick offered to reach out to a friend of his in Moscow. And the friend came back and offered some names. And the email exchange was forwarded to me. And I read down. And there in the original message is David's letter, Dear So-and-So, we have a reporter, Nicholas Schmidl. And then there are parentheses. And it says, good reporter, funny name. <laughs> and I thought to myself, OK, Nicholas Schmidl is a mouthful, but there are some funny names at The New Yorker. And I've always wanted to stop David in the hallway at the magazine and ask him, sort of my best Joe Pesci voice, well, am I funny to you? Am I amusing to you? <laughs> but have so far thought the better of it. Um, the second option was to go to Bulgaria. In Bulgaria was an individual named Peter Mirchev. And Peter Mirchev was Victor Boot's armed supplier. And Peter Mirchev was in some way the linchpin of the prosecution's argument because the prosecution made, was making a case that Victor Boot wasn't just going through the motions but that he was really planning to go forward with the deal and that he was in touch with Peter Mirchev. And I'd been trying all fall to figure out a way to find this guy with no success. And on the second to last day of the trial, the equivalent of the journalistic parting of the seas, the prosecution, which had obtained Victor Boot's computer in the sting, flashed the Microsoft Outlook entry that Victor Boot had in his computer for Peter Mirchev, complete with Peter Mirchev's mobile number and email address. And I scribbled this down, and the next morning I called Peter Mirchev, and I said, introduced myself, and explained that uh, his name had been dragged through the mud in an American courtroom, and that I wanted to give him a chance to explain himself. And he hemmed and hawed, and I said, listen, I can be in Sofia in two weeks, we can start with coffees and go from there. And he relented. And I began making preparations for this trip. And on the eve of leaving, I was admittedly quite a bit nervous. I've reported on fairly dodgy people in dodgy places over the years, kidnappers in Nigeria, Taliban militants in Pakistan. But I had no support structure whatsoever in Bulgaria. I knew no one. And remember, this guy is the one who gave weapons to the merchant of death. <laughs> so I, uh, I get on the plane. I go to Sofia. Peter Mirchev and I meet. And my whole strategy for getting Mirchev to talk is, is just to try and be charming and to see how it goes. Well, it went fabulously well. Peter Mirchev told me at one point that he wasn't sure why he was talking to me, but he liked talking to me. Coffees turned into Johnny Walker Blacks, and Peter Mirchev just sang for three and a half hours. He brought me inside all these undisclosed weapons deals, told me the names of code words that he and Victor were using for various weapons when they talked on the phone. And at the end of this, I, I ran back to my hotel. I transcribed the interview. I emailed it to my wife and my editor and myself to make sure there was a copy in case, God forbid, something happened between now and the time I got home. And now I'm confident that I'm going to be able to get Victor Boot to talk. I've spoken to his co-conspirator. Surely he has to talk. Not only was Victor Boot not impressed with this venture, he was downright pissed that, as he said, I had gone behind his back. You see, Victor and I had been working through an intermediary, a paralegal who had uh, visitation rights in the prison for the past several months, me trying to get in. And first, Victor uh, wanted a subscription to The New Yorker, which I, in due time, got for him. <laughs> then Victor wanted a copy of my book. Now, I, sh I should say, first off, that the critical and commercial reception for my book was lukewarm, and that's generous. <laughs> the next go-around, I'll make sure that whoever's reviewing it is spend some time in solitary confinement before they get the book, because Victor read it and loved it. <laughs> and, Vi and Victor, 
Victor learned over the course of reading this book that I spoke a little bit of Persian and Urdu. And so a few weeks later, Victor had taken a piece of paper, a scrap of paper from the paralegal's yellow legal pad and written a letter to me in Farsi asking for Persian poetry. And I read the letter. The paralegal sends it on to me. I read the letter. And you know, look, my Persian's a little rusty. I spent the summer of 2004 in Iran studying Persian at the University of Tehran, but it's been a while. So I call an Iranian friend and I said, listen, I just want to make sure that this Russian arms dealer is in fact asking me for Persian poetry. We confirm that he is. I get on the internet. I find Hafez, uh, a PDF for Hafez. I send it to the paralegal. He prints it out, puts it in a stack of legal, fi uh, legal files, s sort of smuggles it into the prison, gives it to Victor, and Victor's ecstatic. And a few days later, paralegal calls me and says, okay, Victor's ready to meet. It's all quite exciting. I get on the train. I come up to New York. I go through the various layers of security. Victor shuffles in the room in an orange jumpsuit shackled at the uh, ankles, wrist, and waist. He's unfastened, and he sits there. And God, Victor is quite a charismatic guy. You don't get to be the world's leading arms trafficker without being charismatic, without sort of having a way with people. And Victor's got a very soft voice. And, you know, at this point, in case you haven't gotten it, this is really as much of a story about seduction as it is about anything else. And Victor says to me that he, we talk, start talking about Persian poetry, and then the role of the Persian language in understanding modern Middle Eastern history. He tells me that he's reading Joseph Stiglitz at the moment. We start talking about survivalist prison stories. Of course, he's read Unbroken, but have I read Papillon? I said, no, read Papillon. He has a shortwave radio that he's able to pick up uh, Russian and uh, American stations. And he goes through and he breaks down NPR's uh, broadcasting selection. He scoffs at Tell Me More. He, <laughs> he explains that all things considered is just, quote, so faceless. <laughs> and he, uh, and he um, it reminded me of a, of a conversation that I had with another lawyer who'd gone in to see Victor early on. And he said, listen, I went in and saw Victor. He didn't want to talk about his case. All he wanted to talk about was black holes and how Stephen Hawking was overrated. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, so things are going well with Victor. He's opening up. Um, and this strategy of, of, of getting someone to, sort of charming someone to get them to tell you the most you know, to get to the truth about someone is, is working. In fact, we start talking about Zen Buddhism at one point, and Victor mentions that he had he meditated, and I asked him if he still meditated in prison, and he said, yeah, I'm meditating right now while I'm talking to you. <laughs> so I, I file the story, and everyone is, seems relatively pleased with it. Um, the fact checkers start doing their work. And the division of labor, as I understood it at this point, was that it was sort of a good cop, bad cop, and I could maintain this cordiality with Victor Boot, and the checkers could be confrontational. And this suited me and suited my medium and long-term goals because Victor, I'd been talking about discussing the prospect of writing a book. And Victor, you know, we said, okay, well, let's see how the story comes out and then go from there. But the checking wasn't going well. The checkers couldn't get into the prison to see Victor. They couldn't get Victor on the phone. And when we gave the notes to the paralegal, they were coming back just true, false, true, false. But we didn't know if the false was that the weapons deal happened in a different year or in a different country or with a different dictator. What was false about it? And so all of these fantastic revelations that I had gotten from Peter Mircheff are in danger and in limbo of being taken out of the story if we can't get Victor's response. So much to my chagrin, it's decided that for those parts to survive, I need to put on the fact checker hat and I need to go into the prison one more time to push these on Victor Boot. And I go in this last time and Victor immediately, you know, he's, he's a pretty astute guy and he says, you know, our relationship has changed. And I said, yeah, you know, I need to go, I need to run through these things. And he says, you're, you're questioning me like a prosecutor. You're trying to get me put away for longer. And he says, uh, and I said, these are just stories that I heard from Peter Mircheff. I'm just trying to confirm them. And this very unforeseen, bizarre love triangle emerges between me and these two arms dealers. And Victor says, well, why don't you write a story about Peter Mircheff? And I, <laughs> and Peter Mircheff would later call me and say, is Victor mad at me for talking to you for the story? And, in fact, this last conversation became quite antagonistic at times. Victor was, was out of his chair, his, in, his face inches from mine, spitting in my face, telling me that the American empire is going to collapse and that he'll get out of this jail before long. When I left the prison that night, I had a pretty good feeling that the book wasn't going to happen. Um, but I had also, in some ways, revised my idea of, of, of how you get at the sort of how you get at the real Victor Boot, because I genuinely thought that I glimpsed as much truth about Victor in those moments of rancor as in the earlier moments of philosophizing and introspection. 
And to no one's surprise, after the story came out, I have yet to hear from Victor Boot. He's not acknowledged my letters. But I do track his movements in the Bureau of Prison System to make sure that his New Yorker subscription follows him wherever he goes. <laughs> and in fact, there are two gift renewal cards that have been sitting on the kitchen counter for the past two weeks, one for my younger brother and one for Victor Boot. Thanks. Nicholas Schmidt, let's hear it for Nicholas. You know, Nicholas, this story brings up a really important point, which is that a New Yorker subscription is a wonderful gift. And <laughs> the holidays are coming up, and um, if you'd like an intermission, um, David Remnick will be signing you up directly. So please talk to David. Thank you. Just a little public service address moment there. Um, okay, we have one more story before intermission. And while we're at this point, how have you enjoyed the stories so far? Have they been good? Yes, good. Done very well. So our third storyteller, I said, tell us something about The New Yorker we don't know. And she said that every story that's published in The New Yorker, in addition to having a writer, an editor, a fact checker, and a copy editor, also has something called an okayer, who just okays the story and says, okay. That really didn't fascinate you either. But bear in mind, these were all kind of, you know, hard to, to put out there after we start with that exciting umlaut diaresis thing. That was kind of a high bar. <laughs> anyway, let's hear it for Rebecca Mead. Rebecca. Is that good? Is that a lot? That's better, yeah. Is that good? Is it going to drop halfway through? No? Okay. No. Good. Okay. Um, one of the things that people always ask me about working at The New Yorker is, do you come up with your own ideas or are pieces assigned to you? And it's different for all of us. But in my case, um, I often take ideas from editors. I like taking ideas from editors. For one thing, it means I don't have to convince them that it's a good idea. Um, and as a consequence, I've written a lot of pieces about people that it wouldn't have occurred to me on my own to write about. And a typical, typical kind of piece for me, it's usually a cultural profile, um, sort of slightly ironic, arch profile about somebody powerful and rich, often. Um, and uh, there's a particular kind of effect that I, I try to achieve, which is that I want the person I'm writing about to recognize themselves in the piece and to feel as if they've been treated fairly and maybe even to learn something about themselves that they hadn't thought of before. And I want the readers of the magazine to open it up and read it and say, oh my God, I can't believe she got him to say that. Um, so I'd been doing this for some time and I'd got, got quite practiced at it. I, I mean, I knew how to do it. I knew, I knew what I was doing. But I'd also started to feel a few years ago a little bit stale um, and a little concerned that maybe this was all I was ever going to do, was going to write arch ironical profiles of people. Um, and I started to feel that maybe I should be doing, trying to do something that I didn't already know how to do. And I thought about this and I, and I, I remembered something that David Remnick, our boss, had, had said once in an interview. Um, He'd written a book about Russia, and then he'd gone on to write a book about Muhammad Ali. And when asked why Muhammad Ali, he said, because I wanted to spend time with something that I loved. And I thought that it was time for me to spend time with something that I loved too. So I decided I wanted to write a piece about the great Victorian novelist, George Eliot. I had always loved George Eliot ever since I first read Middlemarch uh, when I was 17 years old. And I'd gone back and read this book every five years or so. Uh, and every time I went back to it, I felt as if I, and I understood the book better, but I also felt as if I understood myself better. And I felt as if I understood other people better too. So I had this idea I wanted to write something about George Eliot, something about Middlemarch, but I didn't know what that piece was going to be. So I thought some more. And I, an idea came to me, which was that I had seen, I think first, time I saw it was on a refrigerator magnet, a phrase attributed to George Eliot, it's never too late to be what you might have been. 
And then I found it in other places like inspirational blogs and this kind of thing. It was never, there was never any kind of citation given for it. It was never, the source of it was never identified. Um, and I was very skeptical about whether this actually was something that George Eliot had indeed said. Um, it didn't sound to me like anything that she would say or think. I mean, Middlemarch is all about how it's actually too late for all kinds of things. Um, and so it didn't ring true to me as, as, as a George Eliot thing. It sounded more like a bumper sticker or a kind of, you know, affirmation, self-help, American nonsense. I didn't buy it at all. And it also didn't, didn't resonate with how I felt about my own life at this point. I was in my early 40s and I'd started to realize that, you know, actually it is kind of too late to, to, for some things to happen. And, and, um, uh, and I was feeling, you know, for myself that there were things that I, I, maybe ambitions I'd had or aspirations I'd had that I hadn't fulfilled. And, and, and so there was a way in which I wanted to prove, a sort of perverse way that I wanted to prove that George Eliot hadn't actually said this because if she had said it, it meant I had to take it seriously. And the last thing I needed was the great George Eliot on my back telling me I needed to reinvent myself. So, so this was my, my sort of original idea, um, and in order to then to, to approach this idea, I thought, well, okay, I've got to go back and read all her books. So I went back and reread all the novels, and I read her diaries, and I read letters, and I read books about her, I read biographies, and all this reading took me about two years, and, and um, I didn't find the quote anywhere, and... I also didn't feel that I was really any closer to figuring out what this piece I was going to write was going to be. Um, so, I, so, so at this point, I thought, okay, I'm going to apply the tools that I know I have, the things I know how to do. I know how to write profiles. I've never written a profile of a dead person, but maybe I can approach her in the way that I would approach a, a, a profile of somebody who I'm going to write about. Um, so I thought I'm going to go back, I'm going to go to England, I'm going to go to where she's from, and I'm going to try to put myself in her place, and maybe that will help me understand, and maybe that will help me figure this out. So I did something that journalists hate to do, which is that I bought my own plane ticket, <laughs> I booked my own hotel room and paid for it, and I took myself off, without getting an official assignment, I took myself off to England, and I went to an organization uh, called the George Eliot Fellowship, which is a kind of literary society devoted to, uh, to George Eliot and her works. And they were having a weekend um, in Nuneaton, in the Midlands, where she's from, devoted to her. So I went along to this, this weekend, and the highlight of the weekend was a bus trip that was uh, sites of her youth. And um, it was a bit like being on a school bus trip, uh, except that Nearly everybody on the bus trip was 55 and up, and I, I was the youngest person there, which was really nice because that doesn't happen very much so, <laughs> anymore. Um, and, and we went on this ride around sites of her youth, and we went to the cottage in which she had been born. Her father was a land agent for uh, a landed gentleman, um, and uh, the, on the estate there was this this cottage, and this is where, where she'd been born, and we didn't go into the house. But we stood in front of the house, and I looked up at the house, and I looked up at the window of, of what I was told was the bedroom in which she'd been born. As I looked up, I could imagine, you know, the cries of her mother in, in childbirth, and I could imagine the, the cries of this newborn child arriving in the world, and it was, it was very powerful to be there. And it was also wonderful to be with all these George Eliot aficionados uh, in this literary society who were incredibly warm and incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I wouldn't say that I felt like I was among my people um, because, you know, I, I, I like not fitting in. I mean, that, that's how I feel most comfortable. Um, but I did feel as if they embraced me and took me in, and they were all very wonderful. None of them knew where this quotation came from. I came back to New York, and I happened to be having lunch a couple of weeks later with David. And he said, what have you been up to? And I said, I have just been on this trip to England with this 
Literary Society of George Eliot fanatics, and he said, you have to write a piece, you have to write a personal piece about George Eliot and you and why it matters. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, I went away, spent a couple more months procrastinating, <laughs> writing another ironical profile of somebody. Um, because sometimes when you really want to do something, it's the hardest thing to get yourself to start. But eventually, I did uh, get myself to sit down and in a very few days, wrote this piece. And I handed it in to my editor, Daniel Selewski, at the magazine. And he read it, and he said, this is great, but you need to put more of yourself into it. We need to know more about your personal investment and your life here. Um, you only get one chance, you only get one shot to write this piece, so you've got to make it really work. And I said, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm English, we don't reveal ourselves too much, it's all a little... He said, just, just try. So I went away, and I revised the, the beginning of the piece. Um, and instead of beginning it with George Eliot's childhood home, I began the piece with my childhood home and my adolescence and my first reading of this novel, and my early adulthood, and the ways in which this book had woven itself into my life and had become a prism through which I saw my experience and saw the world. Um, the piece ran in the magazine, and the response I got to it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my life. I got emails from people I had not heard from in years saying that um, they were so grateful that I had given expression to the way that they also felt about Middlemarch and the, the importance it, it had for them. And I had messages from people I'd never met saying that they had not ever read Middlemarch, but now they were inspired to do so because of the way that I had described being inspired by her. And this was a revelation for me because before then, I knew th that I could entertain readers with my writing, but I didn't know that I had a power to move them in this way. And it was, it was very powerful to find out that I did. Um, part of what this made me think was, oh my God, I should have been writing about myself and my feelings for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but of course, I realized that I couldn't have written this piece until I got to the point in my life where I wrote it, that I didn't have anything to say before, but at this point, maybe I did, and, and, and that in a way, it had taken me 25 years to write this piece. Um, I never found the source of the quotation. I also wasn't able to prove that George Eliot hadn't said it. And really, the argument of the piece was to make a case that this phrase, it's never too late to be what you might have been, was not a George Eliot-esque kind of thing to say. Um, I still believe uh, that she didn't say it. Um, I, I still believe it's not true. It's still, it's never too late to be what you might have been, still sounds to me like a bumper sticker. But what doing this piece did make me realize is that it wasn't too late for me to look at where I was and to look at where I'd come from and to ask myself where I might go next. Thank you. Rebecca Mead. We'll see you after the mission.
Let's hear it for Leo Carey. Come on, let's really bring it. Leo, why don't you, Leo, why don't you join me for a minute? Um, Leo and I have been doing these. I'm just going to take this off the mic it's for a little bit, sort of Dr. Phil kind of moment we'll have here. <laughs> Leo has been doing uh, these moth shows. I guess you've done every one. We've done four of these now for the New Yorker Festival, and you've done um, every one of them, but you've, in the past, you've played the cello, and I, I didn't realize you also play um, uh, the piano. Um, do you play any additional instruments, or is, is that it? Uh, I used to play the oboe, but I gave that up at the end of my teens. We all have that sort of crazy flirtation <laughs> with the oboe. It's, uh, it's rebellious. Uh, it's a real, like, fuck you to your parents. Um, I'm just so glad you like straighten out because a lot of kids, you know, that, that's a gateway woodwind. Um, it's really bad. Um, so Leo, but this is, this is the big, I learn something new about you every year. For example, this year I learned um, you were from England and that's, that's interesting. And then, um, and then also, um, you're, you're now, your title is, um, is senior editor. You, were, you had been the deputy books editor, and you were doing the briefly noted, the little briefly noted things, which is, you know, when a book doesn't really merit a full-on <laughs> New Yorker takedown. <laughs> they uh, do uh, briefly despised, and then they put it in there. Um, but, but you said in our little, I thought it was sort of a, little sort of snippy exchange we had. You said that you had actually been doing the work of a senior editor for some time. No, no, no. no. All, all it is is that people at the New Yorker aren't really thinking in those sort of title terms. It's like in the 90s there was this brilliant cartoon with this sort of businessman looking out over the factory floor and he's saying, productivity is up 15% since I made everyone a vice president. And that's kind of our attitude, is that you're sort of just doing your thing and you're gradually taking on more stuff and if you don't make a complete mess of it, they'll perhaps give you more to do and then eventually, you know, you sort of inch forward but in a sort of contented way. <laughs> if, you, if you're not contented, you don't inch. I had a, trouble, a hard time getting that microphone back, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, Leah was starting to do like a whole set you know, it's like, you know, the thing about The New Yorker is, um, but like, are you still involved? Um, I, I assume you're editing things outside of the book area, too. You're doing other editorial things. Um, in it, you know, in addition to your, you know, lounge responsibilities. Um, but uh, are you still involved in the books side of things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, still. Can I, I don't know if this is improper, can I suggest a couple of books that maybe you've overlooked but that might work in Briefly Noted or something that I've come across? Okay, um, these sort of under the radar things. There's this book out by this woman, J.K. Rowling, <laughs> and she apparently has written some books for, for children that have been very successful, and she's got a book out for adults now um, that's uh, amazing. I've, I read it, although, you know, very, have any of you read the new J.K. Rowling book? It's very, it's very well written. Sloppy editing, though, because the editor should have said to her, you've got to do a pass in the manuscript where you put in wizards. <laughs> because it has no, there's like, they should have done like a wizard draft where they put in, so there's no wizards in it anyway. But other than that, if you read it and imagine that all of these people are doing magical things to each other instead of the boring shit they're doing, it's a great, great book. So that's one to put in as a possibility. And then, um, uh, do you like to laugh when you read a book? Do you ever like just want to chill out and, and laugh? Not so much. Yeah, you're English, that's right. But do you guys ever like to just chill out on something light and just like to laugh and laugh? I have been reading this book. It's called Fifty Shades of Grey. And um, um, pee in your pants funny. It is really something. Anyway, Leo Carey. Let's hear it for Leo. He's the best. Okay, so we have two more storytellers and then we're going to call it a night, um, but um, I asked, I had to write these down because I asked my next storyteller uh, to come up with something that uh, we don't know about the New Yorker, and um, he actually had two things. I had not heard of either of these pieces of trivia, so let me read them to you. 
One of the working titles for the magazine when it was first uh, founded in 1925 was Truth. That's interesting. That, that was what it was maybe going to be called. And this is the other fact, is um, the character of Optimus Prime in the Transformers movies is based on legendary New Yorker editor William Shawn. <laughs> that is also really interesting. Anthony Lane! Um, how do you become a film critic in The New Yorker? Um, that's what people often say to me. It's not what they mean, of course. What they mean is, how do you <laughs> become a film critic at The New Yorker? You know? um, it's a, the answer is quite simple, which is, um, uh, I shot a movie. Um, and not a moose, an actual movie. Um, now, this is not unusual. Plenty of people go back and forth between writing out movies and actually shooting them. Um, it's a very long, distinguished list, probably headed by Francois Truffaut. Um, but there are three differences in my case. One is that most people who do that tend to be French, and, um, uh, which I'm not, although God knows I've tried, you know. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> secondly, they tend to go from writing about movies to then shooting them, whereas I'm the other way around. And thirdly, when I say I shot a movie, I don't mean I made a motion picture, I mean I shot a movie, okay? Uh, let me explain. Um, New York writers come from many, many different backgrounds. Um, uh, as you probably know, James Thurber was raised in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, by a litter of bloodhounds. And um, uh, was I, come from a, um, I come from a military background. Uh, my father is a retired general, my grandfather is an admiral, uh, my uh, great uncle is in the Marines, and before that they were all men of God. Um, including an excellent man who wrote a book in 1902 called Goal of the Universe, which sounds like one of those sports compilation DVDs. You know, Goal A, Moral Discipline versus Ultimate Chaos. And it's... Um, uh, but actually, a military life is kind of zen in a strange way because you move around all the time, so you don't... As you can tell. And... Um, <laughs> you move around all the time, um, and you don't own any property. And in fact, you don't own any stuff. You know, all we had was like some pictures and some books. Um, we did have this book on the shelf, and I just remember seeing the spine. It was called The Thurber Carnival. Um, but I thought it was a thriller. I thought it was like the Eiger Sanction or the Bourne Ultimatum, so I never bothered. Um, uh, and um, the other thing about being a, a military family is, um, well, you're really cut off from normal life. So um, I went away to boarding school when I was eight years old. Uh, in the countryside, and uh, I genuinely would say that I knew more about the life of uh, a boy my age and his education and habits in Rome in 53 BC than I did about a boy my age in the public school two miles down the road. Um, and the other thing is that larger social currents, such as surging around the world in the 60s and 70s, simply passed me by. You know, if I'd been taken to Woodstock, as age of seven, you know, I just would have gone through the crowd going, get a haircut, get a haircut, get a haircut. <laughs> and, and all these names, these names which seem to rule the world to other people, like Jimi Hendrix or, 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 or the Rolling Stones, were to me just names, nothing more. So I'm that, I'm that saddest of, of Englishmen, you know, the one, the one who, you know, lived a life entirely without Mick and Keith, and it's an absolute tragedy. And it's... Um, uh, and so when I was um, uh, 13, um, well, before then, I'd gone to one, my one example of American culture, of course, which I had no grasp of whatsoever, never been here, um, was when I went to Berlin in 19, late 1960s. And I went shopping the PX, and um, we had the catalog of the PX, which was like Encyclopedia Americana, you know. Um, and then we watched American Forces TV, and so I watched Get Smart and Bewitched and things. And I, I thought that all American wives were like Samantha. I thought they were all these benevolent witches who appear to be subservient to their husbands and in fact completely wrap them around their little finger and rule the place. Um, and indeed, this turns out to be true. And some of them actually become Secretary of State, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> and, um, but at the age of 13, my father went off to Northern Ireland, which is then quite a dangerous place. And it was quite dangerous to be back home as well because there were various things being committed. It was quite risky. And so before he went, um, 
he said, you know, when you go shopping, you need to look under the car in case there are any wires or little mirror and so forth like that and bombs underneath the car, and that was fine. And he said, also, you need to um, protect your mother, okay? So if they come up the stairs, you know what to do, okay? So with this in mind, I was taken down to this, this hut, this long, low building, sort of semicircular and cross-section, and um, I uh, went in. It was very dark in there, uh, and all I could see was this sort of uh, this screen at the end. There was gravel underfoot. Um, and this movie started. Um, not a very interesting movie. I hadn't seen it before. Uh, it was just a street scene, a couple of low buildings, two-story buildings. Um, nobody around at all. And then this figure appeared at the window. And then the film stopped. Uh, now, why did the film stop? The film stopped because I made it stop. Because I was holding an SLR not a single lens reflex camera, which is a perfectly harmless piece of equipment, but a standard British Army issue 7.62 millimeter self-loading rifle. Um, it's actually quite a powerful piece of kit, the, S the, the SLR. And it's, um, uh, in those days, I was quite a delicate soul rather than this vast strapping hunk of beef you see before you today. <laughs> Um, and it was considered that the kick from it might actually send me right in the middle of last week. So I had a slightly adapted version down to a 303, but nonetheless, it had a certain character. When I fired, there was a, a microphone next to the muzzle of the gun, and uh, it picked up the sound of the shot, and it stopped the film. And I had shot at the film, and you could then see where the bullet had gone through. There was this little pinprick of light where the bullet had pierced the screen, and you could see whether you'd hit the guy or not. And this is how we learned to shoot. And with me was a corporal from the gunnery section who was you know, advising me what to do. And we then moved on to the next piece of film, which was almost completely in darkness. It was like film noir, just shadows moving around. And I was firing blindly and wildly at these people. Um, well, I did start to get a little bit better at it. And then finally, we got to the, um, the final one, which was uh, the camera was just going down this country track in the woods with like trees on either side and grass underfoot. And I thought it would be like this figure scurrying away in the distance, instead of which this guy just stepped out right in front of the camera and pointed his weapon at me and fired. And uh, the film stopped. I fired wildly back. The film stopped. And the corporal leaned down and went, you're dead, son. <laughs> now, of course, this did raise interesting questions about how to approach movies. There are many movies I would like to shoot. I mean, not just the obvious ones, like Adam Sandler movies, you know, and documentaries about penguins and things like that, just picking them off on the ice floe one by one. Um, but um, just before they get to the egg, you know, they've been going six months to get it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> got you, little sucker. And, um, but also, like, eat, pray, love, shoot, die, you know. Um, but then you could... But also I was thinking about... I remember this stayed with me. I was watching The Hours... And I was just thinking, if I could just get a clean shot at Virginia Woolf, maybe I could just take the tip off her nose and she would turn back into Nicole Kidman, you know? Um, or um, how about um, Once Upon a time, time, time in the West? Charles Bronson's face fills the screen for 10 minutes without moving. He blinks once. You've got to take the shot. Or at the end of Dirty Harry, he's pointing the gun at me. It's like the guy in the film. He's got his 44 Magnum, I've got my 7.62 with a 303 adaptation, of course. And he's asking the question, he's, you know, and he says, well, do you? And, you know, I have to say, well, actually, speaking as a punk, I don't feel terribly lucky today, so if you don't mind, I think we'll do this another day. Um, of course, the person who would really enjoy the whole thing, who would find it, welcome the whole idea of shooting a film like that, completely, as completely natural and embrace it utterly, is someone like Werner Herzog, you know. I mean, to him, that would be perfectly normal movie behavior, you know. What do we say when we're, say we're shooting a film? Is it not because we are really stopping killing time with images, you know? And um, so, uh, so the, the, but this was, the, this is the beginnings of movie criticism. Of course it is. You know, you watch carefully, you take aim, you take the shot. Sometimes you miss, sometimes you hit, sometimes the movie gets a better of you. Now, what happened was, of course, this is all my lost youth. It's all a long time ago. When I was a child, I spake as a sniper. I understood as a sniper. I thought as a sniper. But then I grew up and I 
put away snipey things. And I, I came to the New Yorker. And I immediately realized things were different here. There was, I was made extremely welcome, lots of very nice people, but I sensed that none of them had my weapons training. And, um, and you must realize lots of New Yorker people actually are brought up in those households where their nurseries are actually papered with covers from the magazine. Um, so it's like imbued it from an early age, and their parents lean down and go, honey, we love you very much indeed, and we just want you to be happy. And your daddy and I just think when you grow up, you can be anything you like at all, as long as you're a staff writer at the New Yorker! You know, and so they do. This is fine. Um, but how can I say to these good people that I had spent less of my life in creative writing programs than I had in the turret of a chieftain tank? You know, would they have understood these things? So I just buckled down and started writing. And I forgot the whole thing. And then about two years into my time in the magazine, I was walking down the corridor and Maury Pearl came towards me. Maury was the head of public relations of the magazine. And she said, Anthony, we want you to do some television. I said, no, no. I said, no, certainly not. And she said, um, <laughs> and she said no, Anthony, we want you to do some television. I went, mm -hmm. I had to explain to her. I mean, I want to say, you know, I... <laughs> broadcast media and me just don't mix, you know, like oil and water and Mormons and politics. It just doesn't work, you know? And so, and I was about to give up altogether, and, and I said, oh, what's the name of the show? And she said, Crossfire. <laughs> and I thought, my hour has come. <laughs> you know. Come, come, Mr. Bond. You, know. you, en you enjoy kidding just as much as I do. So I said, okay. And I went downtown, I was taken down in a car, arrived at this low building, nobody around, a guy shows me into this room, and all there is is a camera. And nobody even operating it, it's like a robot camera. I'm thinking, where's my gun? <laughs> you know, where's my rifle? Where's my .762 with a 303 adaptation? I need it here. It's, this is called Crossfire, for God's sake. I'm then given a little thing, a little grommet, and I put it in my ear. I'm thinking, what's going on? This voice comes out, and the, vo the voice says, Mr. Lane, this is Charlton Heston. Now, many people in this room would have gone, be gone, foul Satan of the NRA. And some of us would have gone, you know, in our most cinephiliac way, we would have gone, oh, my God, you know, I, I, I love the movies. You know, I, you know Ben-Hur, Touch of Evil, you know, oh, we worship you. Thank you. And the rest of Tristan and Zolder will follow after this speech. Um, uh, instead of which, of course, I just said to him, my brother in arms, you know. I wish I could reach out and shake you by the cold, dead hand, you know. Um, and then other people said to come through my ear piece. I mean, Michael Medwood was on, and Mike Kinsley was there, and Pat Buchanan was on, because he was one of the moderators. And this voice came through my ear, with all different parts of the country, and he said, um, it's the Oscars tomorrow, it's Dark versus Light, it's Pulp Fiction versus Forrest Gump. Anthony Lane, in your review of The New Yorker, you said that Forrest, Forrest Gump was a cowardly film, how can you possibly justify that? <laughs> and we were off. And there then followed what was, against, I have to say, hot competition, the worst 45 minutes of my life. And uh, I was put back in the car and brought back to the office, and I got back, the show aired that night, and the next day, nobody said anything. And they didn't see, say anything the next day either. In fact, I noticed people were starting to avoid me. You'd be walking down the corridor and they'd go, I, and they'd kind of go. <laughs> and women would go into the men's room and men would go into broom closets, you know. Anything to avoid having to meet my eye and say anything. And finally, four days later, I'm walking down the corridor and Maury's coming towards me. Maury Pearl is coming towards me. And I thought, this is her job. She's got to say something. And she just comes up to me and she puts her hand on my arm and she goes, television, it's a very difficult medium. She was right, and that was the last time that I ever attempted crossfire, in fact, firing of any kind. And yet, I look back on my 13-year-old self, and I thought, you know, I was onto something there. This was the first beginnings, the first glimmerings of what it is to be a movie critic. What do we do? We sit there in the dark, we take our best shot, we take aim, we make the shot. And, you know, what effect do we have? We're not one of these critics who can close a show or ruin a reputation you know, kill someone off, you know. It just doesn't happen like that with movie criticism. What do we do? We take aim. We make a little pinprick of illumination. And for a moment, we give people pause. And then, whether we like it or not, 
on goes the movie. And it's like I'm walking down the track once more with the grass under my feet and the trees on either side. And there ahead of me is Star Wars, the Revenge of the Sith, you know. <laughs> and I take aim, and I'm just about to go for it, and out steps George Lucas, right in front of me. <laughs> comes towards me with his saber and just leans down and goes, you're a dead son. Thank you very much indeed. Anthony Lane. Well, I think you've probably already learned something else you didn't know about The New Yorker this evening, which is that with few exceptions, everyone on The New Yorker is English. <laughs> this is true. It's been like fucking Downton Abbey up here tonight. <laughs> it's like, excuse me. I fancy a drinks party right about now in my flat. Good grief. feel so alone. Okay. Um, well, we have one more storyteller, but before we put him up here, we have some thank yous to do. Very important. First of all, let's thank all of our storytellers. An amazing job. <laughs> Leo Carey, senior editor, oboist. Our venue, SIR Stage 37. Let's hear it for Stage 37. Now, some very special people, the people from The Moth who really make all these shows, and you know, not just the New Yorker Festival, but their live shows and their stuff on the radio and their podcast. Uh, the Moth's curatorial producer is Meg Bowles, and she's here tonight. Meg, it's here for Meg, she's right there. The wonderful directors of tonight's show, Catherine Burns, Jennifer Hickson, and Sarah Austin Janess. Yes. The producers of tonight's show, Robin Waxberger and Joan Firestone. Let's hear it for them. And then The Moth would also like to thank, uh, in addition to the aforementioned Rhonda Sherman, um, the producers, Michael Shulman, Jennifer Berrio and Amanda Cormier. Did I pronounce that correctly? Was that Cormier? Hope so. Did I get, Rhonda, did I get that right? Is it Cormier? I did. Okay, yes. Um, good. Cormier. Um, the New Yorker Festival continues all weekend, so please come out and support all the events. And as for the Moth, their next Moth main stage show is Around the Bend, Stories of Coming Home at Cooper Union on November 14th, and their website is themoth.org, right? Okay. Are we ready for our last storyteller of the night? Okay. Now, this is something I, he told me something I did not know about the New Yorker, but this is absolutely true, that in the New Yorker's library, every article ever published in the New Yorker is collected in black binders. And when you have accrued enough articles you get your own black binder. And that, on the, on the um, spine of it, your name is then written in white ink on the black binder, and that is called um, a tombstone. This is true. This is like skull and bones or something. <laughs> this is the craziest thing. But people actually kill to get that. That is such an honor that um, people, people do that. So that's, um, that, by the way, is also the saddest thing I've ever heard, but <laughs> it's true. It has the benefit of being true. Let's hear for our last storyteller, Lawrence Wright. Larry? Oops, I'm going to be Anthony up here if I have to. I've always been fascinated by religion and religious belief, why people believe one thing rather than another, especially in America where you can believe anything. I've written about the Amish, Mormons, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Satanists, atheists, Jimmy Swaggart, and the children of Jim Jones. But I've always been particularly intrigued by Scientologists. 
They form an esoteric subculture in America rooted in Hollywood. All those billboard personalities that associate themselves with that church. I wonder why do they lend their credibility to such a stigmatized religion? They must get something out of it. And what could that be? I had spoken to our editor, David Rimnick, in the past about writing about Scientology. We both understood the hazards. Scientology has the reputation of being a vindictive and litigious organization. In 1991, for instance, Time magazine published an expose of Scientology, and the church sued it, a suit that lasted for more than a decade, even though Time won at every stage along the way, all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was the most expensive suit they ever defended in their entire history. I didn't want to put our magazine in that position, nor did I want to spend a decade in a courtroom. But there are some stories that just won't let you alone. When you tell a complicated story like the church of, about the Church of Scientology, ideally you want to have an appealing protagonist, what I call a donkey. I, I know it sounds like a disparaging term, but a donkey is actually quite a useful animal, a beast of burden who can carry a lot of information and take the reader into a world that he might not ever be able to go into otherwise. For this story, I would need a really good donkey because the reputation of the magazine was at stake. I had my eye on Paul Haggis, a two-time Academy Award-winning writer and director who had dropped out of the Church of Scientology after 34 years. I wrote to him, even though he's never told his story before, and suggested that I would do a profile of him for the magazine. When we met, I said, of course, the article is occasioned by your decision to leave the church. His eyes got wide, but he forged ahead manfully. It was only months later when Paul admitted that he was so flattered that the New Yorker would do a profile of him, he never thought it would be about Scientology. But he turned out to be a very courageous and sturdy donkey. Now... The laws of storytelling require that the protagonist have an antagonist, an anti-donkey, if you prefer. In Paul's case, that would be Tommy Davis, the chief spokesperson for the Church of Scientology International. Tommy's main job up until then was to extol the virtues of his church and its goal of saving the planet. But lately he had been charged with mitigating the damage to the church's reputation that Paul's resignation had caused. So he was not happy when I called him and told him the story I had in mind. He revealed that he was a lifelong subscriber to the New Yorker. And he hated to have his beliefs portrayed to the magazine's readers through the eyes of a defector. But he eventually agreed to meet me and as he said, take me through Scientology. We wanted enough time to do that, so we set aside Memorial Day weekend. So I flew out to L.A. Tommy Davis personifies the marriage of Scientology and Hollywood. His mother is Ann Archer, one of the legendary beauties of the screen who starred in such movies as Fatal Attraction and many, many others. She acts as a kind of unofficial den mother for the Scientology celebrities in Hollywood. Her son is also movie star handsome. He has his mother's sleepy eyes and a spiky haircut that accentuates his resemblance to his friend Tom Cruise. Somewhere along the line, the expected trajectory of Thomas D Tommy Davis's life took an unexpected turn. He dropped out of Columbia University after a single semester and joined the Sea Org, the Scientology, the Scientology clergy, and entered a Spartan dormitory where he receives $50 a month in payment. I thought if I could get Tommy to talk to me honestly, I would find out something about 
his motivations in the lure of such marginalized beliefs. I sat in the hotel all day Friday waiting for Tommy to call. And all day Saturday. And then finally Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Tommy and his wife Jessica Feshbach arrived at the hotel. We sat outside by the pool. Among the sun worshipers, Tommy looked strikingly pallid and haggard. He said he was not going to take me through Scientology as he had promised, nor was he going to let me interview him. He said, I just wanted to have the chance to tell you that person to person. Well, thanks a lot, Tommy. You could have told me that on the phone. But I was furious. At great expense to the magazine, I had flown out to Los Angeles. I'd spent three nights in the hotel waiting for him to call. I was sure that he had been ordered not to talk. He said that wasn't true. But he agreed to respond to fact-checking queries that the magazine might put to him. I doubt that Tommy had any idea of what he was in store for. The fact-checking department is my very favorite department at the New Yorker. You can walk through that department and hear languages spoken you never heard before. At one desk, somebody will be speaking to Will I Am about the history of rap, and at the next desk, somebody's chatting with the Emir of Dubai about currency fluctuations. It's unlike any fact-checking experience I've ever had in any other magazine. At the New Yorker, the checkers read your notes. They listen to your tapes. They call your sources. I think of them as very erudite and polite agents for the KGB. <laughs> the lead checker on my story was Jennifer Stahl, a German speaker who kept a French horn in a battered case under her desk. She's a very precise young woman, and she read my first draft and compiled a list of 971 fact-checking queries. Her first volley, which she sent off to Tommy Davis. There followed what I assume was a really appalled silence, and then an onslaught of legal threats, and then finally, in late September 2010, Tommy and his wife and four Scientology lawyers arrived at the New Yorker offices, along with 47 white binders, which contain the church's responses to our 971 queries. Leading the Scientology legal delegation was Anthony Michael Glassman, a former assistant U.S. attorney who worked in a Beverly Hills boutique firm representing movie stars. On his website, Glassman brags of a $10 million judgment against the New York Times. On our side of the table was my editor, the two checkers that were at that time on the story, the head of the fact-checking department, our lawyer, and David Remnick, who sat down after introducing everybody and said he'd just stay for a few minutes. He scarcely got up from his chair for the next eight hours. As Tommy Davis made his presentation, the lights of Times Square reeled garishly behind him. I particularly remarked the Dunkin' Donuts sign over his shoulder. Despite the audience that stood between us, I realized that what this really was was my only chance to interview Tommy Davis. He deflected personal questions. It was frustrating. At one time, he said, I'm not a person. I'm a messenger. That just made him all the more intriguing to me. <laughs> it was one of the most compelling days of my career as a reporter. At one point, during a brief bathroom break, Remnick pulled me aside and said, you know what you got here, you schmuck. You got a book. The hours passed, sandwiches were brought in, the sun began to sink, the Dunkin' Donuts sign got brighter and brighter, and finally the meeting broke up. We were all exhausted. The, the 47 white binders were loaded onto a dolly and taken to a disused computer room with no windows in it, and I shut the door and began to stack the binders one by one on the bookshelf and stared at them lovingly. 
They stretch for seven linear feet. I think only another reporter would understand the feeling of joy that I felt looking at those binders. I think that the Scientology intention was to drown me in information, but you can't drown a reporter in information. It's like pouring water on a fish. Eventually, six checkers were assigned to the story, including the head of the checking department. We were all aware of the legal hazards. The article itself grew to more than 25,000 words. I wouldn't want you to think that has anything to do with the fact that I get paid by the word. <laughs> it finally appeared in the February 2012 anniversary edition of The New Yorker, the one with Eustace Tilly on the cover, the, the fop and the top hat that commemorates the first issue of The New Yorker in 1925. The article came out on Monday morning. By Wednesday, it had been downloaded two million times. We all waited anxiously for the Scientology response. Finally, some months later, a group of Scientologists stood outside the Condé Nast building, passing out copies of their magazine titled Freedom. The New Yorker, it said, what a load of balderdash. On the cover was a cartoonish version of Eustace Tilly. The New York Times media reporter said the next day that it was a bum on the cover. Now, I live in Austin, so uh, the Scientologist sent me a personally hand-delivered uh, copy. It said on the manila envelope, your personal fact check copy. I opened it up and I realized that it wasn't Eustace Tilly on the cover, it wasn't a bum, it was me. Inside were 53 pages attacking me and the New Yorker and most offensively the checkers who worked on the story. After the story came out, I wondered what happened to Tommy. He seemed to have disappeared. He was still listed as the church's international spokesperson, but he wasn't doing any speaking. Through the informal Scientology grapevine, I heard that he had blown the Sea Org. In other words, he had fled, but he had been recovered. Meantime, I was working on that book, and I desperately wanted another donkey. I wanted Tommy. I wanted him to tell my story. Through another Scientology defector, I learned that Tommy and Jessica had left the Sea Org together, and that Tommy was supposedly selling real estate in Texas. Sure enough, he bought a house 2.8 miles from mine. I wrote him letters. I knocked on his door. I don't like pestering people like that. But Tommy was a character in my book, and the greatest sin you can commit as a reporter is to write about someone and have him later say, well, he never talked to me. Finally, one day, Tommy opened the door. He was tan. He looked relaxed. He had a fashionable, grizzled beard. I don't think he'd ever been more handsome. He said, my views haven't changed at all before closing the door in my face. I still hope Tommy will tell his story. Maybe not to me, although I'm sure we'll bump into each other one day in Austin. He's going to make somebody a wonderful donkey. Thank you. Lawrence Wright. That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. Good night.